Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for Electiontools.org, Helping Elections Officials Do More With Less. My name is Julian Johansson. I am Director of Research and Training here at Nonprofit Vote. If you aren't familiar with Nonprofit Vote, uh, we are a nonprofit that helps other nonprofits um, reach out to the people they serve to help them register, vote, and become civically engaged in other ways. We focus primarily on 501c3 service providers and community-based organizations. Uh, we provide training, materials, and other resources. If you'd like to learn more about us, please uh, feel free to check out our website. It's www.nonprofitvote.org. We are very lucky today to be joined by Kurt Sampson, who is uh, government, Kurt, help me out, sorry, government. It's government Services Associate. Government Services Associate um, at the Center for Technology and Civic Life. Um, and Kurt is going to um, show us uh, one of the projects that they have been um, working on in conjunction with a couple of other partners um, uh, on creating tools that uh, any elections official or any interested third-party organization could use to do a variety of things, including um, hold a voter registration drive. So with that said, Kurt, uh, why don't you take it away? Awesome. Thank you so much, Julian. So we'll go ahead and get started. I'm focusing today on the Election Toolkit, which has been around just over a year. We launched uh, June 16, 2016. So we just recently celebrated its one year of existence, which we're super proud of. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the ways of made, measuring the impact that it's had in this last year. So here are the basic things we're going to look at today in the webinar. We're going to start with some introductions. Um, I see some familiar names in the list of attendants, which is awesome, welcome. But for the other folks, I know that um, I might be a new face, so I want to talk a little bit about who I am and of course introduce my great organization that I work with, Center for Technology and Civic Life. I want to get into focus pretty quickly on how, but also why, the Election Toolkit came together, uh, the need that it was hoping to resolve, and the, the methods and process we took to put it together. There are 16 tools in the toolkit. It's not possible to look at them all in the course of just a few minutes, but I do want to provide a closer look at just a few. Like Julian said, there's a tool that we're really proud of in the toolkit called the Voter Registration Drive Kit, which uh, has a lot of great resources for running voter registration drives. So I'm going to show you that as well as two additional tools that I think are helpful for kind of getting a sense of the scope of what is in the toolkit. And of course, at the end, there will be time for questions. So if you come up with something that's um, kind of burning in your mind, take a note of it or put it in the chat, and we can, we can deal with that stuff at the very end. We always have objectives for our conference presentations and our webinars that we do. So here, here are our objectives for today's session. We want to make sure that you understand why we created the toolkit. We want you to have a sense of how you can use the toolkit in your civic engagement work. And we also want to understand, we, excuse me, we want you to understand how you can contribute to the toolkit. The toolkit is very much a, a living, growing, evolving resource. It's not something that's just sort of established and done. It's something that's always changing. And we like to have people contribute to that change and get involved. Great. Here's me. I'll go ahead and introduce myself before I get started talking about Center for Technology and Civic Life and the work that we do. So my name is Kurt Sampsel. I've been with CTCL, which is our little abbreviation, for two years now. Um, all of us at the Center, of course, contribute something I think a little bit different to our work. And what I've brought is my background as a research and communication specialist. Um, I have a PhD from Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. And when I was there, I also worked as a broadcast journalist. So some of my other colleagues contribute great expertise in things like uh, election administration, nonprofit management, software development, uh, data management, and things like that. So we all bring something a little bit different to the table. And of course, there's my contact information if you need to get in touch with me for any reason. Um, I do tweet not super actively, but somewhat about election issues and election technology at, at Kurt underscore Samsel. And I'm always looking for new followers, so please feel free to follow me on Twitter. Awesome. Let's go ahead and get into CTCL. 
The Center is a nonprofit civic tech organization uh, based right here in Chicago where I am today. We work to increase public access to civic information. And we do that because it's our belief that the more information people have, the more likely it is that they'll participate in the civic life of their communities. I'm sure a lot of you are sort of nodding your heads along with that sentiment. So to do this kind of vital information work, we do things like partner with tech companies, we work with state and local election offices, and sometimes we work with other nonprofits. Um, I think you'll see a couple of cases of all three of those actions in today's presentation. People often ask us where our funding comes from. We think it's understandable, and we're really pretty glad to share the information because it's good news and we're really proud of it. We depend, like a lot of nonprofits, on a mixed revenue model. So we get generous foundation support, uh, especially from Knight Foundation, Democracy Fund, and Rockefeller Brothers Fund. Uh, and we also get fee-for-service contract work with some of these larger tech companies and organizations. Um, those are the Facebooks, Googles, and also the Women Donors Network. CTCL has two main programs in our organization, so I want to introduce those briefly. Our civic data team does just absolutely amazing work that we love bragging about, to be perfectly honest. What they do is they collect, standardize, and publish the nation's largest civic data sets that answer two big questions. What's on your ballot, and who are your elected officials? Uh, and through partnerships, they put that information in places where people are, places where people go on a regular basis. Here are two really cool examples of that work. Um, these are from last November. So last November, if you went to Google, not just November, I should say, but the entire, the entire fall, if you went to Google and entered my ballot or something like what's on my ballot, what popped up is our data. So you'd be prompted to enter your home address, then you get this great detailed ballot information. That's what you see at the top there. Um, in the fall, we also partnered with Facebook, who created this really cool preview your ballot feature. Maybe some of you remember seeing this last fall. Facebook, what they did was encourage users to basically make a voting plan. So again, you'd start by simply entering in your address, and then you could view all the candidates and issues and contests that would appear on your ballot. Uh, without ever having to leave Facebook. So you know, we understand that people use a lot of these online communities as their, the way they access information, um, even really important information like voting information. So this is an effort to put that information where people are. To date, these data sets have been accessed more than 200 million times, which is a huge number. Um, so it's a super popular and important way to kind of provide that information places where people need it. On the government services side of our organization, which is the part that I work on, we're taking a slightly different approach to the same basic task of increasing people's access to civic information. So what we're doing is we're working from the inside of government. We do that by helping election officials use technology to promote civic engagement and to make voting easier. Our government services team coordinates a network of election officials across the country uh, which we call electricity. We, we really like puns at our organization, so you'll run into those from time to time. So we put electricity together as a way to sort of replicate and scale the experience of going to a conference and seeing you know, what other people in your field are working on and uh, what their common challenges are and uh, a new project or a new technology they might be using that's worked really well for them. So our network is focused on keeping election officials informed by highlighting best practices, new technologies, and new programs that are being used by other people in the field, kind of like a conference. Um, it's worth taking a little pause here to talk a moment about what I mean, or maybe I should say who I mean, when I use the term election officials. This is actually something that I personally was unsure about before I came to work at CTCL, which is why I think it's worth taking a moment to talk about it. So election officials are different than politicians and representatives who are typically elected officials. So that's one distinction. Um, now it's true that some election officials are elected, but the main point here I think is that these are election administrators. Um, you might be thinking of the friendly people you see at your polling place, but those actually are just poll workers, or in some places they're called election judges. So instead, yeah, we're talking about the folks who work in municipal, county, or state offices and help administer elections 
um, for their communities, for that area. So their view on elections is basically as the people who make everything come together. Um, I often use the terms election administrators and election authorities as synonyms there. But like I said, I just think it's important to, to clarify what I mean when I say that term. Because as I said, even I was sort of confused by it at some parts of my life. So a lot of you in the audience may not be election officials. I definitely see a few who I know, which is awesome. But one thing that I would stress is that all of you have an election official, even if, you don't, even if you're not one yourself. Um, and since you're in this webinar, I know you're interested in civic engagement, democratic participation. So maybe what you could consider doing is looking them up. Look up your election official. Um, follow their office on Twitter if they have a Twitter account. And if you can, expose them to the election toolkit and kind of show them how it might benefit their work and in turn benefit your community. Okay, so we keep our network of election officials updated with our newsletter called Electricity also. And this comes out every month or two. What we do for the newsletter is we collect and share success stories from the field basically, along with guidelines or tech tutorials or resources so that people can get started using whatever tool or resource or technology that we feature in the, in the main article. So here's an example from our main newsletter which um, talked about a registrar in Connecticut who's using Tableau Public. It's a free version of a data visualization tool to make these really cool interactive charts of his office's voter registration data. Another thing that uh, government services provides is professional development. Um, our organization offers a lot of stuff for free, but one thing that we provide um, that does cost a little bit of money is our professional development courses for election officials who want to learn new technologies and start new programs. One thing that we think is really special about the professional development that we offer is um, the fact that we travel. So here's, here's an example. This photo is from Harford County, Maryland, and a training that I and my colleague Whitney May, you can see Whitney pictured there, um, provided for them in late April on how to use social media and how to improve their election website. So you know, we understand that a lot of election administrators are busy people. They have a lot of stuff on their plates. And a lot of times they wear, they wear different hats. So they have a lot of different sort of stances or projects that they take on on a day-to-day -day basis. And unsurprisingly, they're often working you know, with short staffs and, and low budgets. So our ability to travel actually to election offices and to provide these trainings is, is something that I think really distinguishes us from other professional development providers in the civic tech space. And of course, another of our government services projects is the Election Toolkit, which I'm going to focus on today. So you've heard the phrase toolkit a few times uh, in the presentation so far. I want to go ahead and be clear right now about what it is. So the toolkit is a website that we launched in June of last year that has 16 tools and each tool also comes with step-by-step -step instructions. The reason we do that is so any election official can pick up the tool immediately and get started working with it. You don't have to have any particular baseline in terms of tech skills. Um, the tools are designed for everybody, for anybody to get started immediately. Tools range from helping to solve challenges around communicating with voters to using social media to designing um, really effective outreach materials. Um, to gathering and using data to minimize things like voter wait times. I'm going to go ahead and move forward at this time to talk about how the toolkit came together. So creating the toolkit was a highly collaborative process. Um, like your high school project, it was a group project. But unlike that, everybody actually played a part. We didn't get stuck doing all the work. So we partnered with um, our great friends at the Center for Civic Design and three local election offices um, from different parts of the country. The Cook County Clerk right here in Illinois, the Hillsborough County Supervisor of Elections, which is the Tampa area, and the Inyo County Clerk Recorder and Registrar of Voters in rural Inyo County, California. We purposely partnered with jurisdictions that sort of represented the urban, suburban, and rural approach to election administration because each area or each kind of area, I guess I should say, has its own kind of challenges. So together we put together a pitch and we submitted our pitch to the James L. Knight Foundation's News Challenge on Elections in the spring of 2015 to basically promote the idea of putting together a toolkit to provide election officials with, with useful, cheap, affordable, in a lot of cases, free technologies.
In addition to our project partners, uh, those three offices, we actually engaged dozens of election officials in the process of designing and assembling the toolkit. A little over a year ago in Chicago, we brought together um, I think about two dozen election officials from all over the country who kind of like those other jurisdictions, they represented you know, really small places, really big places, places that have really big office budgets and places that have small ones. And we had them submit ideas. What kind of tools would you like to have in the toolkit? Or maybe in fact you have an idea for a tool that you've used in your office that you um, can share with us. Basically, we had them all write down their ideas on sticky notes, and we ended up with, uh, I believe, over 300 sticky notes, which if you've ever had to sort through sticky notes, I can, I can testify that that is quite a lot of them. It took a lot of time working through those ideas. So we narrowed those ideas down. We took uh, several months to research and build, in some cases, the tools that we needed. And we launched the toolkit in June of last year. One aspect of this slide that I want to call your attention to is the, the word with in italics here. The toolkit was built with election officials. And we emphasize that in stark contrast to the idea of building it for election officials. Um, something that we see a lot of times in the sort of culture of civic technology is solutions that are sometimes in search of a problem, right? And it was really important when we were putting the toolkit together to share the role of coming up with ideas um, and to share our expertise as civic technologists with the expertise of the target audience. Um, so we wanted to make sure that they were right there at the table, like you can see pictured in this photograph, um, and not, not simply an afterthought. Um, the toolkit was built with, by, and for election officials. As I said, uh, we just recently passed the anniversary of the toolkit's launch, which we're super proud of. Uh, it's worth taking a moment to share a few details about its impact. So at this point, we've seen traffic in excess of, I believe, 8,500 unique visits. And they've come from all 50 states. Now some of those states we had to do some really targeted research. I think, I think North Dakota and Wyoming, we had to, we had to really pound the pavement to get them to check it out, but everybody did go eventually, all 50 states. Um, you can see we're especially popular in a few states and still hoping to make a little bit more impact in other states. Um, we did a toolkit impact survey last winter, and one finding that we really liked was 90% uh, of the people surveyed said that they would recommend the election toolkit to a colleague, which we think is really great. Uh, we published over a dozen news stories as well on the toolkit website, electiontools.org slash news. And basically what those do, those are success stories or impact stories. So they explain how election offices or election officials have used the tools and basically shared the experience that they've had. And if they made something with the tool, we try to, we try to show a photograph of it or a screenshot or an example of the thing that they made. Um, in the year or so since we launched the toolkit, we've also expanded the collection of tools from 11 when we started to 16. So we've added five in that year. And we have several more always in the development stage. So several that we're being um, kind of taking, taking the stages of doing, doing the research and looking at uh, the ways to add them to the toolkit. Here's what the toolkit site looks like. Again, it's electiontools.org. Um, I want to call attention just briefly to a few of the special features here. So these colorful circles you can see at the top, those are categories. Um, what's great about them is that they can filter the tools for you. So if you are super interested in community outreach but maybe not so interested in polling places, you can click that community outreach icon and the tools will sort to only show the ones focused on outreach. Um, and you can use all of the categories in the same way. You can sign up on the toolkit. Uh, on the right corner there at the top right. If you sign up, it's nice because you get to bookmark tools and you also are able to leave feedback, which we take super seriously. We love hearing from people who are using the tools, um, both good experiences as well as suggestions and challenges that they're experiencing. So signing up is a, is a great benefit. Um, we also do provide occasional um, update emails, not, not nuisance emails, I promise. Uh, useful update emails on what's happening with the toolkit if you sign up. So that's a benefit with that. So if you click on one of these tools, you can see there are three at the top there. If you click on one, basically you get more information. Um, it lays out what you need, the resources you need, and what's required. 
and then you can kind of get started with the instructions. There are in th these accordions that you can expand when you look at the tools. And there are two basic instruction sections, getting started, which is sort of like the first steps to put it together, and then using the tool, which of course is focused on actual, actual use. Um, and if you're not seeing a tool that you maybe were looking for or you had in your mind, or maybe you have a really awesome tool that you have used that you want to share with us, there's a function if you scroll at the very bottom of electiontools.org um, that just says suggest a tool. So you can click on that and really quickly shoot us an email of a great idea for your, um, your tool that you'd like to see us add. All right, cool. So at this point, I want to go ahead and give you a closer look at some of the tools in the toolkit. Like I said, it's just not possible to show all 16, but I want to show one that I think might be especially um, useful and relevant to this audience, and then two others that are just really cool for showing the range of the tools in the toolkit. Okay, this is the first one. Voter Registration Drive Kit. This is one of our most popular tools. I believe it's our most bookmarked tool. And it's one that we see really regularly being used not only by election administrators, but also um, a lot of different people. For instance, we've heard from high school civics teachers who have used this tool, um, student life people at universities, uh, representatives from community health centers, and um, also advocates for people with disabilities. So we're really um, impressed that the, this tool has had such an impact and has reached far beyond just the administrative community. So really anybody involved in civic information and um, engagement campaigns and get out the vote efforts can benefit from this very simple but we think pretty powerful tool. It's definitely one to keep in mind, of course, this September in the lead up to National Voter Registration Drive, or excuse me, National Voter Registration Day which, you know, as Julian said, is, is coming up. And we know Nonprofit Vote is now running this year, and we're super uh, excited for them. So kudos to you guys for that, by the way. Great. So when you click on a tool to look at it, you immediately notice these breakdowns of expectations and needs. All the tools, like I said, they come with these great step-by-step -step instructions so that you don't need to just sort of dummy your way through something. You can um, have a really helpful bit of guidance to help you work with it. So you can see on the left there the what's required, almost no technical skills, uh, just one out of five. It does require a little bit of time, but not a great deal of resources. And then on the right there, it just lays out really specifically what you need in order to use the kit. So obviously it's helpful to have a computer. Um, if you're using the posters, you need a printer. A few staff members, if you're actually holding a physical drive, for instance at a community event, Obviously, you need registration forms for your state, again, if you're holding a physical in-person drive. And hey, it always works to have helpful office materials like clipboards and pens. So the registration drive kit is basically a combination of guidelines and best practices on the one hand, and handy outreach materials on the other hand. So obviously registration guidelines vary by state, of course. I think we're all familiar with that. But the tool includes uh, really straightforward answers to questions about how to run a registration drive effectively, and it provides helpful resources for getting started. The best practices include everything from you know, something really basic just like how to obtain registration forms to more nuanced things like how to avoid perceptions of partisanship as you're holding your registration drive. So here's a sample. This is a screenshot that just shows a quick sampling of, of the FAQs for this tool. With the guidelines come these great outreach materials, like I said. So if you're going to have a successful registration drive, needless to say, you need to tell people about it. So that's why we've provided uh, email templates, sample tweets and hashtags that you can use, sample Facebook posts, and sample social media graphics and poster templates that you can use. That's what you're seeing on your screen now. Um, this past year we worked with language outreach coordinators from the Chicago Board of Election Commissioners. Um, they're my local election authority right here in Chicago. So they're the people I would go to in terms of administration. So we work with these language coordinators to make all of our graphics and templates available in what are the three most commonly spoken languages in the United States, that is English, Spanish, and Chinese. Um, all of these templates and the graphics are there for you to download and use for free right in the tool. You can just download them really quickly in a zip file. And you know, I often feel this experience when I'm, when I'm using a resource that's been made by somebody else. I might feel like a little, a little sort of awkward, like, oh, I should be building this myself. But you really don't need to feel weird about copying 
um, or stealing anybody else's work when you use this tool because we want you to use this stuff. It's specifically provided um, totally free of copyright so that you can use it and feel really comfortable about it. In fact, we honestly get pretty excited when we see people using materials from the kit. Um, here's an example that we saw from the El Paso County, Texas Elections Department. Um, I saw the name of Melissa Rosales earlier in the list of participants. Um, Melissa, I believe, is the person who tweeted this. So shout out to Melissa for doing awesome work. So as you can see, they use one of our uh, fairly new Spanish graphics, which makes good sense because El Paso County is uh, right there on the border with Mexico. And the message, of course, is simply asking, hey, do you have a new address? Well then, it's time to get a new voter registration. It's really cool to see how people take materials from this tool and kind of customize them for the needs of their community. Here's a good example of that. So this is um, an example made by Sherry Newton, who works with the Disability Law Center in the state of Utah. You can see on the left there is the kind of original poster template. And you can see that if you looked at it closely, it just has this sort of placeholder information that you need to customize with your, with your local information so that it offers the specific details about your drive. So what she did is um, she made the headline text really big, which makes perfect sense if you're targeting an audience that might have a little bit of difficulty seeing the disability community. And she replaced the bottom two photos, which I thought was interesting. You know, she trained the, I'm sorry, she changed the, tree-lined urban street in the middle to a photo that, as you can see, looks a lot more like Utah, right? Um, and she changed the bottom photo of the woman to show a face that I guess she thought might just resonate a little bit better with her target audience, somebody just a little bit um, older, for instance. The photo on the left is a, is a pretty young woman. Cool, so let's go ahead and move on. Having looked at the, the registration drive kit, I also want to show two other tools just kind of quickly, as well as use cases and um, quick user testimonials. Uh, we like to call these success stories. You know. So this is our Civic Icons and Images tool. Unless I'm mistaken, this is actually our most used tool. What's great about this tool is that it's um, really low tech. It's literally just a collection of image files. Uh, but it's still a really powerful tool because images are just so helpful for communicating information and getting people's attention in a really, really quick, straightforward, and easy manner. So the Hawaii Office of Elections used this tool, and um, I'll show you an example of what they did here. So the, the Office of Elections in Hawaii, they wanted to create a brochure that would really quickly clarify the process of absentee voting. Um, I'm sure a lot of you in this call are sort of like following all the different voting procedures and voting process changes that are happening in different states across the country. Uh, like for instance, of course, a lot of people are trying to promote more absentee and more early voting. Um, and if that's the case, you need to kind of get involved in these information campaigns. I think that's what was happening in Hawaii. So they used these civic icons in the brochure that they made to show the, the three-step basic process in voting absentee. Now if you look at these, they, they look really simple, right? It's just a person marking a ballot, signing her name, putting it in the mailbox. But I think what's so great about this tool is uh, you, you don't have to make these images. You know? Imagine if you had to draw something like this from scratch or use, or use Photoshop or some design program. It would, I, I couldn't possibly do it. I mean, it would take a long time. So what's great uh, about having them available and having them you know, there for free, categorized for you without copyright st restrictions, it basically means that you've got uh, design power that maybe you didn't have before. That's the case in, in Hawaii. That's something that they emphasized was a real benefit of using this tool. So Raymond DeVega, he's the election specialist at the Hawaii office. He basically discovered that having these icons available for his use made it so that he could create the entire brochure, just him, one guy at his desk. Uh, he didn't need to use outside support. He didn't need to talk to somebody else in um, local government, in his government office. He didn't need to pay anybody for it. He could do it totally himself. This is what he said. He said, many times it's a lengthy process getting vo voting collateral designed. Having these images allowed us to bypass outsourcing the work and put election information out on short notice. 
Here's another tool. This is one I really love. I think it's just really interesting and cool. Uh, this is one of the tools that we actually uh, created. Uh, we actually used an independent developer here in town who is who's awesome. His name is Mark Pelzarski. Some of you may be familiar with him. And he created this tool from scratch and, and sort of worked with us to get it before an audience. So this is a tool, Voting Timer app, that works on a mobile phone, and it's built specifically to help you time how long it takes somebody to vote a ballot. So I know all of us you know, have heard all these problems about people having to wait in long lines to vote. Um, and this is a tool that can actually help resolve that really big, really challenging problem. Ballots, of course, vary by place to place and from election to election. And if you're able to know how long people will spend in the voting booth, that can help administrators make really important resource allocation decisions. You know, how many booths do we need at a polling place? How many poll workers do we need at a polling place? And so on. That can actually help to avoid these long wait times. So it's a really simple tool that has the potential to have a huge impact. Here's what the tool looks like. Um, you've got places where you can log activity in four voting booths. So when a voter enters the booth, and takes a ballot in there and gets ready to mark it, you press this Voter Enters button on the left. What's great about having all four is that you can track four booths simultaneously or four voters simultaneously. Um, if you're doing it kind of manually with paper and pen, it's not really possible to do that. And when someone leaves the booth and it's vacant, you press the Vacant Booth button. Or if there's another voter ready to take the first voter's place, you press the Voter Enters button, just tap that. and um, it starts to log the time for that next voter. What's great is it does all the, the data collection and calculations for you. So at the very end, you're able to download this really handy spreadsheet, and it shows um, all the times that you've logged for every voter. And of course, once you have that spreadsheet, you can do all the you know, amazing, cool, powerful spreadsheet things that you're, you're used to doing, like finding averages, uh, sorting information, visualizing it with, with cool graphics and um, charts and stuff. Um, it's just it's a really amazing, powerful tool that just works in a, in a mobile web browser. Jonathan Aberg from the San Francisco Department of Elections, he told us that in the past he actually did use a stopwatch and paper and pencil to time voters. And he used this tool and just found that it was just obviously a lot faster and easier to do it. Here's what he said. He said, I'd expect we're going to be able to collect a much larger number of observations, but with the same staff, same number of people. Since the data is uploaded digitally to our account, it will be saving us a ton of data entry and, of course, the potential errors that accompany any data entry project. Awesome. So that's a quick look at three tools. Again, the idea is just to give you a sense of the, the scope of the tools. There's really a great variety. Again, when you go to the website, you can kind of sort them by category or just kind of cruise through and see what catches your eye. Like I said at the beginning, um, we really want people to get involved with the toolkit, not just use it as sort of like passive consumers, but really, really contribute to it and really give us feedback. One way that you can do that is to sign up uh, at the electiontools.org website, top right again. This is a way that you can bookmark your tools and leave feedback. Bookmarking is helpful because just like I referenced a few times, it helps us to understand which tools especially resonate with people, and um, you know, hopefully we can replicate those and give people more of what they're, what they're looking for. We also use the hashtag election tools to talk about the toolkit. Um, people share their experiences using the tools when we go on the road promoting the toolkit um, and building new tools and so on, we use that hashtag. So it's a, it's a great way if you want to just follow that to see what's happening with the toolkit website. Of course, one way to get involved is to simply use the tools and in turn th then share your experience with us. So if you've got an experience, uh, used a tool that went really well, or maybe you have some suggestions for us, you can email us at hello at electiontools.org. Now like I said earlier, maybe some of you in the audience today just aren't quite in a position to use these tools directly in your work. But I'm confident that you know people who are. So if that's the case, um, you can sort of replace this bullet with a suggestion to refer your friends to these tools. And again, maybe look up your local election official and um, follow them on Twitter, get in touch with them, follow them on Facebook, and uh, share the toolkit with them and tell them what it can do for them. And like I said, we're always looking for new suggestions for tools. So an easy way to do that is go to electiontools.org suggestions. 
this is something we're especially excited about for, for this new audience because we know that some people in our audience today are just a little bit different than the folks we meet at election conferences that we travel to. So if you have a sort of fresh perspective or maybe you know a really cool technology that you think would fit well in the toolkit, please tell us about it. Um, electiontools.org slash suggestions is the way that you can do that. Here I'm just revisiting our objectives from the, the top of the hour here. We wanted to make sure that you understood why we created the toolkit to get a sense of how you can use the toolkit in your civic engagement work or again, refer others to, to use it and understand how you can contribute to the toolkit. So I, I hope I've accomplished those, those objectives and you have a clear sense of those things now. So at this point, um, I think we are ready to go ahead and take questions. And I'll, I'll right, take yes. a little sip of my water and rest my voice for a moment. <laughs> good, good idea. Um, we do have a few questions that um, have come in. Um, one person was wondering if the um, toolkit has been used by nonprofits working in voter engagement or voting rights, and if you have any um, use case examples um, from, from the sector. Yes. Um, the one tool again that comes to mind is the is the registration drive kit just because it's such a it's such a great general tool that anybody can use. That's something I think I mentioned at the time. It has been used by um, student life coordinators at, at universities and by teachers in high schools, and also by people um, advocating in the disability community. Um, as far as um, as far as voting rights, I, no organizations occur to me. But if some occur to you that you have in mind or you want to suggest a partnership or maybe just suggest for me to drop somebody a quick email, I'm really open to that, of course. Um, I, I hope that that is a way of gesturing to that question. It's hard, of course, with a lot of these tools to know how they're being used because we don't necessarily find that out unless we, you know, like in the case of the El Paso tweet, we just happen to, to see that come across in our Twitter. Um, so sometimes we see things being used, but we do know that things are being used that we don't necessarily know about. So it's a little bit hard to, to testify to that use. But yeah, I think, I think that it's fair to say that a lot of get out the vote organizations, um, you know, especially at the sort of local level, are using some of these materials. So I hope that that answers your question. Great. Um, and with that question in mind, do you guys have sort of a, a running list of which organizations or jurisdictions have used which tools so that if election officials are, are thinking about using a tool, they can talk to several people who have already used it to um, hear their firsthand experience. Yeah, we do. You know, that's one thing that um, our news articles on the Toolkit website are meant to do. You know, again, that's electiontools.org slash news. They're basically success stories and use, use cases. So we highlight an office or a person who's used one of the tools and share their experience. That's a way of sort of um, doing that same thing. Some of the use um, that we haven't actually crafted success stories around, some of that we know about internally that we've tracked in, you know, for instance, the hello at electiontools.org email account. Uh, it's not something necessarily we've made available to election officials, but I think we're really open to that if somebody's curious about who's used what. You know, we have definitely had people, uh, for instance, Jonathan actually from the Precinct Services Division in San Francisco, he emailed us to ask about other people who had used the Voting Timer app and to just ask a few questions about its use. And um, we said nobody had used it yet. We were, you know, just open about the fact that he might be the first. Um, and he felt okay about that. He was brave and went ahead and moved forward with it. So yeah, if, some, um, if anybody wants to get in touch and ask about who's used what uh, via email, hello at electiontools.org, I'd be really happy to give you, you know, absolutely what in, whatever information we have about who's used what. Great, great, thank you. Um, another person was wondering if you have um, done very much in your tools um, to um, to help either uh, voters with disabilities or um, uh, you know, judges or precinct officials um, with disabilities? And have your tools sort of address those needs? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm so appreciative for whoever asked this question. It's a great question. Accessibility from, from day one has been really top of mind for us as we put together the toolkit. Um, it was really important for us to make the toolkit as the toolkit website itself as accessible as possible. So we are really, really conscious about even really simple things like, you know, for instance, we use a lot of screenshots in the instructions for using the tools, and we've tried to be really conscious about using um, smart and effective alternative text for those images so that if there are election officials who are for whatever reason not able to see the images or see the screenshots, they can still get some benefit out of them. And yeah, a lot of the tools, especially those tools that our voter facing, include instructions or parts of the instructions that are specifically focused on uh, making sure that uh, they, the user, is um, keeping in mind people in the audience who may have disabilities. So just to take one example, um, we recently launched a Facebook Live tool, which is basically a collection of helpful guidelines, suggestions, um, you know, scripts, topic ideas, step-by-step -step instructions for using Facebook Live as a way of providing you know, sort of real-time uh, interface between the public and an election administrator or somebody working in an election office. And it was really important to us, you know, when you use Facebook Live, you produce videos with it. It was important to us, so we made sure to have, add instructions so that when you've got the video that you've produced, um, you're able to add captions to it. So we, we walk the user through the process of adding captions to videos both on Facebook and when they maybe um, repost the video to YouTube. So yeah, thanks so much for actually reminding me about something that we a lot of times like to emphasize is how, how much we really have made an effort to um, accommodate both users, people using the toolkit with disabilities, as well as people in the audience of you know, the, the tools that are being used. Um, any additional questions about accessibility, I'd be happy to answer by email. Great. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, here's another interesting question. Um, do you have any tools that might help jurisdictions with translation of materials into other languages, speaking of accessibility? It's a good question. Um, there's nothing currently in the toolkit like that. Um, when we put together those uh, registration, national, reg or excuse me, registration drive, uh, poster templates and social media graphics. You know, we made those in-house using <laughs> um, our background in foreign language and Google Translate. And then we, like I said, we we worked face to face with people who were, you know, native speakers of those language to languages to to make those obviously very much needed revisions. So that's the process that we followed. There's there's nothing like. Um, there's not a tool right now about guiding people toward translation. Uh, I like that idea, and if somebody has a tool that they would like to share, I'd be really, I'd be really open to hearing about it. Great. Um, do you? So, so this is from um, El Paso County, Texas. They're thinking of using um, a text tool, uh, an SMS tool like um, like yours to notify election judges of the number of people who are uh, currently in line. Um, have you ever heard of, of um, your SMS tool being used that way? Um, the, the, I think the literal answer to the question is no. I've never, I've never heard of the tool that we have in the toolkit being used that way in terms of someone approaching us and saying, oh, we used, we used your text messaging tool to also record voter weights. Um, but the, the better way to answer that question is to say that I do think that it has that capability. Um, I know that some election offices have used text messaging as a way to, to do that, to gather uh, wait time data. Um, I, I must admit those people are not coming to mind right now, but if, if I rack my mind and do uh, 10 or 15 minutes of research, I think I could come up with a, a more specific answer to that question if um, the representative from El Paso would like, would like more information. I think I could probably come up with a, with a contact or two about that issue. Great. Thank you. And um, have you guys, this is uh, a fun question from someone who is wondering if um, in addition to the social media graphics you've already created, if you've ever thought about doing animated 
GIFs. Or is it GIF? <laughs> or, yeah, I know. <laughs> I actually say um, GIFs most of the time. <laughs> I, I hear both. I think I mostly hear gifts, but you know, it's, it's one of the big battles in the community right now. Yeah, um, the tool that we use, you know, maybe your, your person asking the question is thinking about the um, infographic design tool. I'm not sure about its capabilities of making gifts. I think that that might be something you need a, um, a pay account for. So I think maybe if you pay and use that tool, you can do that. Um, making gifts isn't something that I personally have done a great deal of. I know our outreach coordinator, um, Victoria, has. Um, again, if somebody has a, has a resource for making gifts that they'd like to share uh, to consider including in the toolkit, I'd, be very, I'd love to hear about that. Great, great. Um, or this is another uh, question about um, how your tools have been used. Um, someone is wondering if um, anyone has ever used your um, your wait time tool to sort of um, create a prediction about how long it takes to complete a, a ballot um, and you know notify people um, who are in line or or um, you know, I don't know, during the early voting period or whatever, um, of how long they can expect to, uh, to need to fill out their ballot. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, you know, we have two kind of like similar ballot or um, polling place timers. The one is the voting timer app, which I mentioned, which, you know, is for actually uh, the amount of time to mark a ballot. But there's also the, the um, voter wait time measurement tool, which is I believe the tool that you're referencing. And yes, oh, right. Thank that, you. Yeah, just to clarify, we know that Arapahoe County in Colorado has used that tool to collect wait times. And they built a page on their website that uh, reported those wait times. So the, the, the reporting mechanism doesn't necessarily, it doesn't come with the tool. Uh, the tool is just a data collection mechanism, and you can then use that data in whatever way you want. But yes, we do know that Arapahoe County has used the data to actually report wait times to the public. Um, and we have, a, we have a photo that's an example of that. It's one, it's one of our success stories that we, we sometimes tell. So if the person asking the question would like more information, um, I could certainly give them information about who put that together. I know that, um, I know that they worked with somebody in the, the GIS department named Dominic Cezanne to actually build the reporting mechanism. So, so yeah, we have heard of people doing that. Great, great, thank you. Um, here's a really interesting question. Um, we evaluate county election websites. Is there a tool to evaluate the readability um, or usability of election websites? Um, we find so many are written at a very high readability level, or I guess uh, for, for advanced readers, I guess. Well, my goodness, we find that too. <laughs> yeah, something, something that my organization, CTCL, offers, uh, we offer free website assessments for any election website, you know, state website, county, municipal, depending on the election authority. So this is, I'm glad to hear that other folks are doing this. This is something that we do too. Um, what we have done to create our website assessment, the evaluative criteria from the Center for Civic Design's Field Guide 7, which is called Designing uh, Election Department Websites, we took their best practices and we translated them into evaluative rubric questions. So when we evaluate a website, we basically go through a rubric just like you might, you know, if you're a, a high school or college teacher grading a student essay or whatever, and um, we work through the, the website and ask, um, ask ourselves questions and respond to that. And um, so we, we offer website assessments. Anybody who's interested in getting an election website assessment can, can get in touch with me, and that's something that we're able to provide free of cost. Um, as far as tools, there are two tools that I'll share really quickly that maybe speak to the question. The one I think a lot of us are familiar with, so, so sorry if I'm stating something that's obvious, but there's a, there's a cool website called the Hemingway app. Um, I think it's HemingwayApp.org or .com. And this is basically a tool to assess the, the reading level of your language. So of course, I think a lot of us who work in the civic 
uh, civic information field understand how important it is to provide civic information in plain language. And the Hemingway app is just helpful for you to identify what language is plain and what language isn't plain. So we sometimes copy text from election websites or from voter guides and stick it in the Hemingway app just as a sort of way of saying like, well, how, how complicated is this? And it kind of spits out a grade level at you. So sometimes it will say like, grade 16, this is way too complicated. Um, calm, it, calm it down. Uh, make it you know, grade 9 or something like that. So that's a great tool that you can use the Hemingway app again for assessing whether you're using plain language or not. And there's also um, a tool called WebAIM Wave. Web Aim Wave that you might be familiar with. This is a tool. Um, I'm not sure if the question was specifically about um, disability accessibility of websites, but this is a tool that's a, a good one that's free that you can use to run um, run a you know cursory, undeniably, but a, a, an accessibility test on your website, and it'll it'll point out things like missing alternative text and um, uh, sort of problems with navigating using a screen reader or through tabbing. Um, again, it's called WebAIM Wave, and it's it's specifically around accessing. Uh, excuse me, around evaluating a website's uh, accessibility. But that's something that might be worth checking out. Um, any other any other questions about website assessment? <laughs> I'm I I've done a lot with that, so it's something that's a lot of times on my mind. And um, my organization, as I said, we, we offer professional development courses. And um, we offer courses for election officials who perhaps need, a build, need to build an election website from scratch, or maybe they have an uh, election website that has been up for a while, but they want to make um, concrete improvements to it. So that, that photograph that I showed of Whitney May, my colleague and I training folks in Hartford County, Maryland, that's what we provided for them. They had an election website for a long time, but they wanted to make improvements. So we traveled to their office, met with them, did an audit of their website, basically saying what's working well and what needs improvement. And that's something that we're, we're always happy to provide. So anybody who's uh, curious about more information about our, our website professional development training, uh, please get in touch. Uh, one, of, one of the people who is curious about your, your tools for readability was wondering if um, some of the tools that you use when you talk to elections officials about the accessibility of their website, are, are those things that you would be willing to provide to other organizations that are interested in, in doing that kind of work locally? Um, are, you, uh, are you asking specifically about the evaluative criteria that we use? Exactly, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that we're pretty open to it. I mean, uh, we're, we're open about the fact that our, our work in this area is, is pretty strongly inspired by the awesome work by Center for Civic Design. Um, so as I said, our evaluative criteria really are translations of some of the research that, that Dana Chisnell, Whitney Quisenberry, and their colleagues have done over the years um, in assessing election websites. So yeah, I, I do believe that we'd be willing to share that evaluative criteria. Um, but like I said, we're always happy to do it for people as well. It's something that I've developed uh, with all due humility, I think a pretty keen, keen <laughs> sense of over the last few years. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah, I believe that. Um, all right, so you know what? Um, we, we don't have any uh, outstanding questions right now. This is probably a good time to think about um, bringing the webinar to a close. So um, I'll give people one last chance um, to type in any, any final questions if they have them. Um, in the meantime, I want to remind everyone that you will receive a follow-up email uh, probably this coming Tuesday. Um, with links that you can use to watch a recording of this webinar and to download the PowerPoint presentation. Um, I'll include um, Kurt's contact information in that email and um, uh, perhaps some of the links uh, that were mentioned during the uh, webinar today. Um, oh, yep, that was, uh, there was just a question that came in asking, uh, uh, asking me to include those readability apps in the, in the follow-up email. So um, uh, I'll be sure to do that. Um, 
Kurt, thank you so much for making the time to speak to us today and uh, lending us your expertise. The tools you've created are absolutely amazing, and um, the fact that you've just put them out there for anyone to use is also uh, amazing. So um, thank you uh, on both of those counts, and um, we look forward to, to seeing what you guys are going to continue to do in the future. Yeah. Thank you so much, Julian, for inviting us to participate. You know, we, we love the toolkit. We love promoting it. We love telling people about it, and we love hearing you stories from people who have used it. So um, thanks so much for giving us the opportunity to do that. And we really appreciate all the folks who have attended the webinar today. And if you have any questions or any follow-ups, you're, you're really welcome to get in touch with me either at Kurt and Tech and Civic, at techandcivicLife.org or our general toolkit email, which is hello at electiontools.org. Great. Thank you so much, Kurt. And uh, just to echo what Kurt said, thank you everyone who joined today. Your questions were really um, excellent and made the, the webinar much more um, interesting and, and, and probably productive for, for all of us. So um, thank you for your active participation. All right. Uh, have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks so much.